Hi, I'm Pastor Matt. I want to welcome you to Crosspoint Church's online worship service. Thank you for joining us. We pray that the worship today will guide you into God's presence. May he speak to you, challenge you, encourage you, and remind you of his power, hope, and love. Now, as you prepare yourselves to worship, I want to encourage you to ready your hearts. Find somewhere comfortable to sit where you can join us with minimal distractions. You can now take this time to silence or to turn off your phones. And I want to encourage you to have your Bible, a journal, and a pen ready to follow along the message and to take some notes. And if you have children, we encourage you to sing together and worship as a family. Now let's take a moment right now to pray and ask God to ready your mind and heart to come into his presence. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide I am not a captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I
could all that is lost ever be found? Could a garden come up from this ground at all? You make beautiful things. You make beautiful. Well, with me. 
far be it from me to not believe Even when my eyes can't see And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the mist of the sea
Dear brothers and sisters, I'm Pastor Leung from Crosspoint Church. Welcome to worship with us online. We give thanks to Pastor So again for his teaching of the past two Saturdays on the book of Job. Now this coming Tuesday and Wednesday, we will start our Mandarin and Cantonese Bible study classes on the book of Malachi. Please register on our website as soon as possible. Also, we have prepared another parents seminar this coming Saturday. Our upcoming parents seminar will be on understanding the peer and social pressures of youth today. Come listen to our guest speaker, Dr. Paul Kelly, who is chair of educational leadership at Gateway Seminary. He has years of experience working directly with youth and researching youth of all ages and different cultures. Come learn how to better understand and communicate more effectively, discipling our teenagers. I wish all of you well in body and soul. See you again next week in the air. Good morning, Cross Pointers. I'm Pastor Matt. I'm very glad that you can join us for worship today. Today, we're continuing our new discipleship series on Go and Make Disciples. And last week, Pastor Alan did a wonderful job sharing with us and teaching us about what it means to be called uh, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And throughout these next couple of weeks, we're going to look dive deeper into some themes on discipleship. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to give our lives to Him? And today, what I want us to focus on is the character of a disciple. And there'll be three things that we're going to be looking at, but there's one specific thing that I'm going to mention here that's going to drastically change how we view discipleship, how we view following Jesus Christ. Now, last week, Pastor Alan went over the calling of disciple, and, and basically, if I just condense it real quickly, uh, a disciple is basically a follower of Jesus, right? He's a person that has centered his life around Jesus, what he has done, who he is, and what he has called us to do. Now, what I want to do is ask you this question. When you hear that term, disciple, what do you think about? Actually, more importantly, who do you think about? Besides Jesus, obviously. But who in your life would you say when you looked at them, when you observed their life, when you listened to their speech and their actions, you said, you know what? That is a disciple of Jesus Christ. Who is that person? What were the things that that person did that came to mind that really stuck out for you that, man, this person is not only a true follower of Jesus Christ, but this is someone that I want to learn from. This is someone I want to disciple me. This is someone I want to mentor me on what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, undoubtedly, several things probably came to mind, right? We could probably do an entire sermon series for, for months on just the characters of a disciple. But when you think about that person, I believe there were things that stood out to you. You know, I've had the privilege of having several disciples or mentors in my life. And they were all drastically different whether in personality, whether in upbringing, uh, whether their life experiences, their, their life stages, their, their ages, um, their interests, their hobbies. There are so many things about them that if you put them in the same room together, you probably wouldn't even think that they'd be friends because they're so different. They'd be nice and cordial to each other, of course, but you would think that they had nothing in common. Yet, I call them my disciples. I call them my mentors because in them I saw a commonality. I saw something in them that I, that I saw from Jesus Christ. You see, as a follower of Jesus, they are called to reflect him. And as my disciples, as my mentors, each of them demonstrated these common traits. And as it's just, just as I mentioned before, we could go for a long time talking about the different character characteristics of a disciple. But there are three that I want to focus on, three that I think really kind of stand as an umbrella over all of the other characteristics. And I believe that when we think about the character of a disciple, when we think about those people we look up to, when we think about Jesus himself, we think about people who inspire us, people who encouraged us and challenged us, again, not just with their words, but with their life. 
you know, I have the privilege and the honor to be able to be here standing as one of your pastors. But I hope that you listen to me or you listen to the things that I teach, not because of just the words that I say, but because you have observed my life. You've seen how I have devoted my life and given my life to following after Jesus. And, and I'm not perfect. By no means I'm saying to be a disciple or discipler, you have to be perfect. But I would hope that the people that we look up to are the ones that inspire us and encourage us, not just by the words, but also by their actions. And what I want us to do today is look at John chapter 15, verses 1 to 13. This is a very famous passage, and, and usually people will take it one way, but I, I want us to see some, something different from this passage this morning. But as we look at this passage, we're going to look at the three things that I believe demonstrate the characteristics of a disciple. And so if your Bibles, please open to John chapter 15, verses starting from verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Now, if this passage sounds uh, familiar to many of you guys, it should because we did a whole sermon series uh, on the I am statements of Jesus. And obviously this is one of those is the, the I am divine. But what does this passage actually reveals to us, I believe also reveals to us the characteristics of a follower of Jesus Christ, of, uh, characteristics of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to give some brief context. As Jesus was teaching his disciple these things, what he was doing was that he was preparing them for his departure. He knew what was coming. He knew that he would be betrayed, that he would be uh, handed over, that he would ultimately die and be risen again, but then ascend back to heaven, to the right hand of God. And so I want you to picture for a moment to put yourself in Jesus' shoes. I know those are big shoes to fill, but I want you to think about this. Here you have your disciples before you those that you dearly love, that those you have walked with for, for so long, and you know how much they depend on you, and yet you know that you are leaving soon. And so what are the words of encouragement that you give to them? What are you trying to instill in them? This, vi this passage obviously uses that illustration of a vine and a branch, and it's pointing to the importance for them that even after he is gone, that they continue to abide in him, that they continue to be with him, even though he may not be there physically. And so one of the things that is Jesus is actually challenging to is a commitment. See, one of the main characteristics of a disciple is that they are committed. You can see it in their lives. You can see how they orient their lives. You can see it in their speech and how they talk. You can see it in how they handle adversity, how they, how they navigate through life. You can see that they're committed to something greater than themselves. What they're committed to is their relationship with Jesus. That's what informs everything that a disciple does. Going back to verse 4, it says, Abide in me and I in you. That means be connected to Jesus. It's important because Jesus is instilling them the importance of carrying on that relationship with Jesus, with that relationship with him. 
And that speaks to us because it continues on. It says that unless you abide in the vine, uh, unless you abide in me, I'm the vine, sorry, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You see, there's a very real consequence when, when we are disconnected from Jesus Christ. It says that we are gathered and that we wither and we're gathered and thrown into fire and burned. And there's many different interpretations for this passage of whether it means, whether he's talking about um, yourself, <laughs> talking about whether or not you're being cast to hell or whether it's talking about the need for further pruning. But what we, all the, but what we see regardless is the importance of keeping connected to Jesus Christ. The importance of building on that relationship, the importance of placing that relationship as a priority in our life. In John chapter 8, verses uh, uh, 32, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, he said that if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. We kind of see this parallel, right? This is, happens before he used that, the analogy of the vine, the illustration of the vine and the branches, right? But here he's already speaking about, hey, part of abiding in me, part of being, staying connected with me, part of a relationship with me is following my word. And in that way, you are truly my disciples. You see, there's, there's no relationship without communication. And what is the main way in which God and which Jesus has uh, communicated to us? It's through his word. You know, in John 1, again, we're using the book of John uh, throughout, but in John uh, first, chapter 1, verse 1, it says that the word became flesh. Jesus is the word. When we talk about a commitment, it's a commitment to a relationship with Jesus Christ. But that relationship only grows if we are in his word, if we practice his word, if we follow it in obedience. Again, I wanted you to think about any relationship that you're in, whether it's a friendship, whether it's your marriage, even whether it's a, a, a co-worker, a boss. In all relationships, there must be communication. How well is your marriage if you never speak to your spouse? How good is your relationship with your children if you never communicate with them, if you never spend time with them, if you never talk with them? How much do you really get done in your workplace if you don't communicate with your boss or with your coworkers when you're working on a project together? How committed are you to a relationship if you never or rarely spend time with someone? When I think about a disciple of Jesus, particularly those that I mentioned before, those that we have looked up to, those that inspired us, encouraged us. One of the things that stood out to, us, to me, and I think to us, was their commitment to the relationship with God. It's their commitment to spend time with Jesus. It was a commitment to be in his word. Whether it was they woke up an hour earlier so they could spend time in quiet devotion with the Lord whether it's they spent hours upon hours trying to memorize the truths and the promises of God so that they would know it and bring it to their heart and be able to share it with others. Whether it was a commitment to come to fellowship and come to church even when they were tired, even when they're weary, maybe even when they didn't feel like it, but they recognized how important it was to stay connected to the vine, to stay connected to Jesus. They were committed above all else, to being with Jesus Christ. How are you committed in your relationship with God? That's the first characteristic of a disciple is that they are wholly committed in their relationship to the Lord. They're, put, they're practicing the word and being in the word. The second characteristic is this, is that they're growing. They're growing. And I want to be clear, it doesn't mean that you don't go through periods when you're going through dry spells, when, when maybe you've taken a step back. It's not, it's not that you're always, you know, have this perfect relationship going on or that, you're, uh, or that you never struggle. 
but there's growth, all right? Uh, John chapter 15, verse 8 says this, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. See, again, you know, in all the book of John, there are only three statements about what it means to, be, to show that you're a disciple of Jesus, and this was, this was one of them that by bearing fruit, you prove to be a disciple of Jesus. Now, obviously, this is a process that, that only happens as we're attached to the vine, attached to our source of uh, nourishment, which is Jesus Christ. And I want us to focus on this, because I think sometimes when we think about uh, bearing fruit, right, we sometimes we think about it's supposed, to, it's supposed to happen like overnight. Somehow it just like pops up right? But when we actually think about what it means to actually grow fruits or grow vegetables, anything that takes time, it's a process. It's a step-by-step process that needs to gradually grow, right? Uh, You know, my wife, Sarah, recently, she, um, maybe just two months ago, we, she started her own uh, backyard uh, garden, and I'm not a green thumb at all. Um, Honestly, uh, I don't even touch it. it. It's all Sarah's. A uh, part of it is also because I'm scared if I mess it up, <laughs> she'll be mad at me. But, um, you know, for me, my, my only experience with seeing fruit and vegetables is at the grocery store. All right. This is when I pick it, it's already, it's already done. And one of the things that Sarah was growing was zucchini, right? And so when, every time I go to a restaurant or to a grocery store, the zucchini that you buy or that you see is usually like, like this big and it's kind of like small, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's just, yeah, not that big. But then these are Sarah's zucchinis. Uh, that's my son, Micah. He's four years old, and he's about this tall. And so the zucchinis are actually like this big and like this wide. And I was like blown away by it. I was like, whoa, how is it so big? How, how, how did it grow so big? And I was preparing this message. I just kind of reminded myself, man, it stayed attached to the source of nourishment, to that vine, to, to where it was continuing to grow and grow and grow. And it was like such a wonderful picture for me about the process in which it takes to bear fruit. We often get discouraged because we feel like we're not effective for the kingdom of God. Or there's areas of our life that we know we need to surrender to God, areas of our life that we know that we're weak in and we're trying to grow in it, whether it's patience or whether it's, you know, kindness or, or uh, self-control and all these areas. And as I looked at these humongous zucchini, I was just reminded that as we persevere, as we stay connected to the vine, we will, we will bear fruit. We will bear fruit. It's not about how many people have we led to Christ. And that's a good, glorious, and wonderful thing that we ought to strive for and do. But it's also about what is the work that Jesus is doing in your life? How is your life different? How does your life reflect your relationship with Jesus Christ? Are we a positive influence in our families? in our schools, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods, in all these areas, do we, are we able to demonstrate growth? Are we able to demonstrate who Jesus is through our life? You know, when I think about a disciple of God, again, a disciple of Jesus, again, those that inspired us, encouraged me, I looked up to them not because I thought they were perfect, not because I thought they had it all together, But what I saw was a hunger and a desire for growth. And honestly, the ones that really stuck out to me the most were not the ones that from the very get-go, I said, man, they're they're so great. But I got to witness how they grew, how they grew through the challenges of life, how they grew through adversity, how they grew through pain and suffering and sorrow. You know, for me, um, one of the people I looked up to most uh, he, lost a, he lost a child. He, uh, it was, uh, the, I mean, uh, his wife was pregnant and gave, uh, gave uh, birth to a stillborn baby. And I can't imagine how devastating that is. But I can remember, you know, as he worked through his grieving process, he actually invited his friends and his families around him 
that even when the, even when the child was born, they still worshiped God together as they held their, their, their stillborn uh, child. And they brought him out to the sunlight and lifted him up as to say, all glory to God, even in this time of adversity, even in this sorrow, even in this tragedy, even in this hardship. You know, that always stuck out to me. Because in that act, he demonstrated his faith. He demonstrated his peace. He also demonstrated his joy, even in the most devastating of circumstances. Bearing fruit doesn't mean that we have it all together or that we have everything going for us, but that we are gradually in that process of growing to be like Jesus. That little by little, we see his effect in our lives. Little by little, we see him changing us. The process of being a disciple is never done. We are constantly growing. And we ought to constantly desire to grow in our relationship with God. The third, uh, the third uh, characteristic that I saw in this passage is a disciple of Jesus is sacrificial. In John chapter 15, again, verse 9 to 10, it says this, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And jump to verse 12 to 13. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. The love that Jesus is talking about here is more than just that gushy feeling, that butterflies in the stomach type of love that is so popular in, you know, in media and television and movies. It's a sacrificial love. It says that in verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. And later in the passage, actually, Jesus says that he calls us his friends. To lay down one's life. The love that he speaks of here is a sacrificial love. It's a costly love. And in this way, we actually demonstrate that we are disciples of Jesus. John 13, verse 34, 35. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. All of this love, this sacrificial love, stems first and foremost from what? From the love that Jesus has loved us with. He can tell us to love sacrificially because that's exactly what he did for us on the cross. When he gave his life for us, when he bore our sin and bore our shame and bore the punishment and the wrath that we deserve so that we would know redemption, that we would know grace, that we would know forgiveness. That's the love that ought to be in every disciple of Jesus Christ. And again, when I think about those disciples or disciples that we looked up to, what set them apart was their sacrificial love. As I said, I've had the, the blessings of having so many mentors and disciples in my life or people I look up to. And that one of the common characteristics that they all demonstrated to me that always stood out to me was how they loved sacrificially. You see, it's easy, to, it's easy to love when we're lovable. It's easy to love when the circumstances are, are not difficult. It's easy to love when it doesn't cost us anything. But each of them, looking to Jesus as their example, gave of themselves. They gave of their time. They gave of their energy. They gave of their very lives to others, to me. That was something that always stood out to me was how whenever I was in trouble, even if it was an inconvenience for them, they willingly took my call or they willingly met up with me. 
They welcomed me at late hours in the night when I was going through hardship or struggles. They listened to me. They walked with me. And it's not that they didn't have anything else going on in their own life. It wasn't that they didn't have other responsibilities. It wasn't that they had other things that they'd rather do. But they gave of themselves. They loved me as Christ loved them. That's the type of sacrifice, the type of love that ought to permeate in every disciple of Jesus. That's why I, you know, I was very tempted when I was preparing my sermon to say, you know what, we need to be, we need to be committed, we need to be growing, we need to be loving. But I don't think using the word just loving by itself encapsulates everything that it, it, it was meant to. And I think sacrifice reveals true and genuine love because that's the love that Jesus demonstrated to us. Are we willing to give ourselves to others, even when it's difficult? Can we forgive those that have hurt us, even when they won't say they're sorry? Can we come alongside those who are hurt or those who are lonely and sad, even if that means giving up our own free time? Or maybe it means not sleeping as much as we want to. just as Jesus demonstrated, all those disciples that we looked to that stood out to us, they gave themselves sacrificially. They gave of themselves to the people around them. They were willing to forego their own comforts, their own pleasures for the sake of others, all so that they would know the great sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. These are the three characteristics of a disciple that I think encapsulates or holds as an umbrella over all the other characters. One who's committed, one who is growing, and one who's sacrificial. And here's the thing, though. As I was preparing this sermon, I was just thinking to myself, I was talking to my wife, too. I was just like, man, I'm not saying anything new here. I'm not saying anything different. And you know what? Maybe some of you probably have already checked out because you're like, man, Pastor Matt, you already talked about this so many times. And you know what? It's kind of true. Because the thing is, we know we ought to be committed. We know that we ought to be growing. We know we ought to love sacrificially. The problem is, why don't we? Or when we struggle, when we don't want to do the things God calls us to, when, when we don't want to spend time with God in His Word, when we don't want to give sacrificially to people who have hurt us or give our, ta- our, our own free time to other people, You know, when we don't want to pick up our friend at 2 a.m. in the airport or whatever. When we allow the busyness of life keep us from our relationship with God. When we use our work or our school as an excuse that we don't have enough time to read our Bibles. All these things I've heard and all these things I've struggled with. And so what good is it for me to tell you to be committed, to tell you to keep growing, and tell you to love sacrificially? When you already know these things, maybe, but you're struggling. Well, there's one word that I think changes how we approach these characteristics. Because no matter how I look at it, when I say be committed, be growing, be sacrificial, we think about, okay, what can I do? But I think one word changes it. And that word is joy. It's joy, right? John 15, 11, and I left it out intentionally before. It says this, it says, These things I have spoken to you. This is Jesus. I have told you to be committed. I've told you to grow. I've told you to be sacrificial in love. Why? That my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. That Jesus' joy can be in you. See, this was the purpose that Jesus told them to abide in the vine, to be in a relationship with him. It wasn't just uh, to be a good person. It wasn't just about being effective for the kingdom. No, it was for our joy. I don't think we ever grasp that sometimes. I think we forget that. That what God desires most for us is to enjoy Him. is to experience His joy. To have those moments of great happiness and great pleasure. But you know what? When we think about being a disciple of Jesus, and we think about that commitment, and we think about what it means to grow, and we think about sacrificing for others. 
Those things can be difficult. It can be painful. It can be inconvenient. It can be even demanding. And I can understand that's why sometimes it doesn't necessarily invoke in us a feeling of, of excitement or, or desirability to want to grow in these areas. But again, we need to understand the purpose for these things. Jesus said that the purpose is for our joy. To give us a sense of delight as we follow him, even in times of persecution, even in times of pain. So often in our life, and I think this is kind of like, uh, kind of like uh, the fairy tale mentality. We want all of life to be rainbows and gumdrops. We want all of life to work out for us. We want to kind of have that happily ever after attitude. But we know the reality of life is that it's difficult. It's hard. But what separates, truly separates a disciple of Jesus is that even in those moments, they have joy. They have joy because they know that they are tied to, they're united, they are abiding, they are committed to Jesus, the vine. They recognize what his death did for them. They recognize the hope that we have in his resurrection. Jesus is for our joy. I think sometimes we don't believe that. Sometimes we think he's the buzzkill. He tells us not, we're not supposed to do these things and not do those things, even though they look fun. But what God truly desires for us is actually for our betterment and for our joy. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you. What is that joy that Jesus speaks about? Just before he talked about the Father's love. The joy that Jesus has is that same joy that he has in fellowship with his Father that love that the Father has for him and the love he has for, him, for, for the Father. You see, that Christian joy is not just about that happy feeling all the time, but it's knowing and enjoying the ultimate and surpassing goodness and love of God. It's to see God for who he is. It's to see his goodness, to see his love for us. And so when we struggle and we will struggle in those moments when we don't want to pick up our Bibles and when we don't want to pray, in those moments when maybe we're, try, we're tired of trying to, to grow in the fruit of the Spirit, when we're struggling maybe with patience or self-control, maybe in those moments when, when we don't want to love sacrificially, when we want to be selfish, I want us to remember joy, that a step towards Jesus is a step towards joy. And I use that word intentionally, step, because, again, it's that process. And sometimes we think it's too far or too big of a leap. But what if we just thought about taking one small step, little steps of faith and obedience to follow God? And I promise you that as you take those steps towards Jesus, you're going to see that you're taking a step towards joy. And that joy is what transforms our obedience. I just want you to, those three characteristics of a disciple that I mentioned, committed, growing, and sacrificial. What I want you to do is do this. Add joyfully before it. Joyfully committed. Joyfully growing. Joyfully sacrificial. Sacrificial. It changes our whole mentality towards it these things. Because I can bet beforehand, as I mentioned before, we probably started thinking already, okay, I need, we need to be more committed. All right, I need to read my Bible more. All right, I need to be, I need to be growing more. Okay, I need to go to fellowship more. Or I need to memorize scripture, right? I need to be a better person. Okay, I got to be sacrificial. Okay, all right, who's someone that I can, can demonstrate uh, an act of kindness towards? And those are all good things and things that we should strive to do. But again, what motivates us, what drives us, what's going to keep us going is joy. We need to change that mindset that taking a step of faith, taking a step towards Jesus is taking a step towards joy. And so when we think about joyfully uh, being committed, right, we see that we desire his word because in it we find Jesus. 
We find fullness of joy. We find our ultimate satisfaction in Him. Now, there's ups and downs in this. Because of sin and because of pain, there's always going to be ups and downs and levels of satisfaction. But here it is, though. But we know ultimately where we will be satisfied. And that is Jesus Christ. That in Him, we find Him to be the most satisfying. You know, again, in one of the I am statements of Jesus, John 6, 35, Jesus said that, I am the bread of life. And through that, you will not hunger and you will not thirst. To be joyfully committed also means that we are joyfully satisfied in Jesus Christ. Because we know that everything that we want and desire and need is found in Him. And then joyfully growing. Jesus died for the sins of the world through that so that fruit could be born through Him namely us, his children, that we would come to know salvation. And growing is hard. It's trying and it's difficult, but we pursue with joy because first and foremost, we know who we are and who we belong to. It speaks to, of our identity. We pursue the things of God, not for selfish gain or, or self-righteousness, but because we desire to please and honor Jesus. And one of the things that we need to do this, and it's probably one of the painful things of growing and bearing fruit, but one of the important things, it's about repentance. In Luke 13, 2, Jesus taught that we ought to bear fruit that is in keeping with, rep- with repentance. See, act of, acts of obedience flow from our repentance. It flows from when we turn from the sin and the things of this world and towards Jesus Christ. And when I, think, when I talk about repentance, this is what I'm talking about. It's a change of the mind that sees God as true and beautiful and worthy of all of our praise and obedience. See, when we turn in repentance, we see God for who He is, for the great, glorious, powerful, wonderful, beautiful God that He is. And we see sin for what it is, how the diminished, the ugliness of it, the, 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 the shame of it, the, the repulsiveness of it. And when we're able to do that, repentance leads us to joyful growth. As we commit ourselves, as we grow to Him, then we now are able to let that joy flow out from us to joyfully sacrificial lives. When I say joyfully sacrifice, it means that our joy in God outweighs our circumstances. You see, joy is not just a feeling or an emotion. It's actually a choice. It's not based on circumstances. It's not based on the situations that we find ourselves in. Because it's so important because a life of being a disciple of Jesus Christ does not mean that we're free from trouble or free from affliction or free from poverty. But rather, our joy in God, it outweighs It outweighs our circumstances. So when we understand that, this is what enables us to give sacrificially because we don't hold tightly to the things of this world. But when our ultimate joy, our ultimate satisfaction is found in God, then we're able to let that joy overflow to others. If we understand the love that God has for us, that joy leads us to love others sacrificially. I know for many of you listening here today, your problem isn't that you don't know you need to be committed. Your problem isn't that you don't know that you need to be growing or bearing fruit. Your problem isn't knowing that you need to be loving or sacrificial. It's that you've forgotten the joy that we have in Jesus Christ. We've forgotten that God is for us, not against us. We've forgotten that God is for our joy and for our pleasure. That a step towards Jesus is a step towards joy. And I hope and I pray that is what you take away today. That maybe you've lost some of that joy and you need to be reminded of who you are that you are a beloved child of God, that you are forgiven, that you are loved, that you are accepted. 
And for many of us, maybe we need to, we need to make those recommitments to be in his word. Whether that is being more structured and when we decide to read our Bibles or spend time with the Lord. Maybe for some of us, we recognize we haven't been very loving, that we've lived very selfishly. And we need to remind ourselves to follow God. In, to follow God is to follow him in obedience. And that obedience leads us to a joyful life. A step towards Jesus is a step towards joy. Would you pray, pr please pray with me? Dear only Father, Lord, we know that calling to be your disciple is not an easy one necessarily. That it requires much of us, Lord. But we recognize that you are greater, that you are worth it all. And so I pray for all of us, Lord, for the brothers and sisters, Lord, that we will be committed to you, that we would demonstrate a growing, uh, a growth in our faith of bearing fruit, that we would love sacrificially, Lord, but I pray, Lord, more than anything, that we would do so joyfully because that's what separates us from everyone else. That's what separates us from this world. That when life does not go our way, when life is hard, when we are going through pain and suffering and persecution, we remain joyfully committed to you. We are joyfully growing in, in our relationship with you and we are joyfully giving sacrificially, loving sacrificially for others, Lord. And in this way, we show, we prove that we are your disciples. And I also want to pray, Lord, for those who may, may, maybe have not yet placed their faith in you, that they may be lost or they're searching for significance, they're searching for that joy. I pray, Lord, that they would take that step of faith towards you and see that is what leads to ultimate satisfying joy. I pray, Lord, that as your people, as your disciples, Lord, that we would never be idle or stand um, complacent where we are in our faith, but that we would demonstrate who you are, that we would demonstrate your goodness, your faithfulness, we would demonstrate your worthiness through our very lives as we follow you. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done and will continue to do through us. Help us continue to be your disciples that will change this world for your name and for your glory. And it's through your son Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen.
Thank you for worshiping with us today. I hope you enjoyed our time and I hope you enjoyed the message. If you have any questions about anything that you've heard today regarding the sermon, I want to encourage you to join us for a time of Q&A at 1045 a.m. You can contact me below uh, for more details. I hope to see you there.